Good morning, everyone. I am Jack Madrid, and welcome to Industry Beacon, where we feature the industry's technology titans who are shaping our future. We're not just talking about success stories, we are diving deep into their hearts and minds and to see what drives them as we decode the future one digital dialogue at a time. Here with us today is the CEO of Lichu Property Consultants, the one and only David <laughs> Lichu. Good morning, David, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jack. You know, you recently released LPC's third quarter property market report. So can you tell us, uh, how's the property market doing and what's, what are some of the key insights that you can share with us? Yeah, I think uh, the property market in the Philippines is graceful under a lot of stress. Um, it's not graceful for everyone. And, and maybe I'll start off with the ones who are having a tough time. I think the mid-end market and the low-end market is been decimated because of three years of hyperinflation, hyperinterest rates, insecurity of job. Um, job growth has been very, uh, very impaired for, for most people. So I think the default rates that developers are experiencing in that category has been unprecedented, frightening. Uh, and I, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of um, stepping back. A lot of developers are reflecting right now on what next to do going forward because uh, this mid and market is being decimated. Outside of this, every other sector is either in recovery phase or status quo or doing really well. So I'll start with um, recovery. The mall space has recovered much more than what it did in 2019 pre-COVID. The issue there with the malls and most businesses in the malls is that their top line might be pre-COVID, but their bottom lines have been hit by hyperinflation and the cost of so many things, of goods. The cost of goods have really gone up around the world because of war, because of calamity, because of COVID, and all these things contributed to higher cost, lower margins. The, most ex the office market, thankfully, thankfully, despite everything, you know, work from home is a big, uh, big thing for the office market. Despite that, and despite lockdowns and COVID and uncertainty of, of global business, the Philippine office property market is still one of the best performing in the world. Our net consumption of, of office space is still very high, very healthy. Um, 2024 will end with almost a million, if not a little more than a million square meters of space mm. transacted. Still one of the best numbers you will find in the world. Uh, and work from home has not destroyed the office market here. It has just slowed down the uh, absorption rate because the Philippines is different than most countries in the world. And that is uh, the Philippine office market only has a problem about supply. It does not have a demand problem. Despite work from home, many BPOs are still growing. Net net, they are growing tremendously despite all the concerns about work from home and AI and lockdowns and job security. So uh, office market is doing well, unlike places outside the Philippines and India. Outside the Philippines and India, work from home is destroying Mm. Uh, revenue flows of developers, therefore it's destroying the credit stability and ratings of these developers. Many developers are handing back and allowing their assets to be foreclosed. The banks are trying to flip it and nobody's buying. So there, there's a lot of uncertainty in the office market around the world. Uh, there's a lot of effort to restructure these assets to convert from office to let's say mall space or residential space with very limited success. Mm, but, but the Philippines is doing really well. And then the most exciting part of the market right now is uh, tourism and logistics. So let's start with logistics. Why is logistics doing better? Because the per capita income in the Philippines is still rising. And it's not just isolated to Manila anymore. It is all over the Philippines. And uh, that has required many companies to have more logistics centers mm -hmm. outside of Manila, 
outside of Greater Manila, outside of Cebu. <clears throat> you look at the transformation that Iloilo has gone through in the last 20 years. You see the transformation that Bacolod is going through right now. Uh, Bohol is going through right now. It is amazing and it is, it is requiring all these logistic centers mushrooming in these locations because that's how you distribute goods and how you distribute yeah. wealth. And then the most exciting part of the property market is tourism. There's 40,000 hotel rooms under construction. It is an unprecedented level of construction all over the Philippines. And again, it used to be isolated in Manila. Now it's all over the Visayas. It's all over Northern Luzon. It's all over Mindanao. So very exciting tourism. Well, you know, um, that makes me feel kind of more optimistic. Uh, about the medium to long term, David. You know, yeah. we've, we've had this overhang of uncertainty on the property market so long. Obviously, you've been, you've been one of the bulls, uh, relatively speaking. But, but compared to what's happened in other markets, I guess as a Filipino yeah. property owner, or we, should, we should be happy, yeah. relatively speaking. Super. I think, I, think the, I think the key words are gratitude and acknowledging how blessed we are as a country i've also you know also happy to hear about your optimism about tourism and the uh, strengthening of countryside infrastructure mm -hmm. this is not just manila and cebu anymore mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which reminds me of my favorite industry let's talk about the it bpm industry david lichu has long been a supporter of it bpm and the roadmap that we launch every six years. So David, tell our audience, why are you such a staunch believer in IT BPM and our industry? It is so transformational. It keeps families together for one. It mobilizes uh, the labor market because of the competencies brought by the multinationals, which is why I'm such a big believer for foreigners investing in Philippines, opening up the country to as many foreigners investing here because we the foreigners shape the market the labor market most importantly the level of competency the network the access to information the access to different ways of thinking the access to finance to make these ideas happen all these things is what makes uh, the the bpo industry so compelling for development we are one of the few countries in the world that totally bypassed manufacturing to grow to this level. It's taken us a long time because of many issues, but it shows the world that there is more than one formula than industrialization. And Singapore is probably one other example where they totally bypassed manufacturing and went straight to services. And look at Singapore today. I just came from there for quite a while and it is so amazing to see Singapore the way it is mm -hmm. today and how we always aspire to be like the, the, the alternative Singapore, you know? Uh, and it is possible. If you look at the amount of competency the BPO industry has brought to the Philippines, it has been amazing. It has been transformational. If you look at how this started in year 2000 with a thousand people yeah. employed, Today, the number is 1.7. 1.82 million. 1.82 million, and we're going to breach 2 million very, very soon. And that, that is a big base. And wealth has really spread through the country because of the BPO sector. You have been, along with you know, the entire Lichu Property Consultants team, it's been a proponent of countryside development. <clears throat> you know, when LPC became an ambassador of you know, IBPAP's Digital Cities uh, program together with the DICT to develop the next wave of uh, uh, digital cities launched in 2020. Can you describe for our audience, you know, the importance of countryside uh, development? Yeah, I think uh, Metro Manila has a population base of 12 million, but it has the economic power of what? 50% of the GDP. The, the, the concentration of the wealth and the economic power is disproportionate. And that has to change. And one of the only ways you're going to change it 
is to bring jobs outside of Manila. You know, the, the, the small skip you can do is to go to Alabang. You know, so instead of holding office, wink, wink, instead of holding office in Manila, in Makati or BGC, what if you hold your first office, your headquarter office in Alabang? What if you hold it in northern Quezon City? Yeah? Then you reduce the commute times mm -hmm. of most of your labor from two to three hours per way to 30 minutes to an hour per way. And that is transformational for their family. That's transformational for their livelihood. Um, yeah, and, and if, you, if you do a small hop to Alabang, why not have a hub office in Cavite or in Santa Rosa or somewhere in Batangas? And there, there you start spreading the wealth, the jobs, the money, and, and, and give a chance for many of this population to grow financially. We're going to continue on the theme of countryside development. But right now, we're going to take a quick break. Industry Beacon will be right back. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Industry Beacon. David, we were just talking about countryside development and it's always gratifying. You know, whenever I uh, do one of our road shows and go to cities like Iloilo or Bacolod, uh, Dumaguete, Davao, I, I feel a renewed sense of energy with, with all the, the growth and the redistribution of the economic benefits of our, of our in industry. And that kind of accelerated during the pandemic, which, you know, if we look back, uh, COVID was such a game changer and how it has evolved how we all work, right? So we're now living in a hybrid work world. Uh, and, and, and some people say it's a must for this generation of uh, job seekers. But you recently came up in one of our conversations with this concept called work near home. Now, how does the, how does the future of work uh, look to you? I think uh, a lot of companies are, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm known to be the anti-work from home uh, person. Uh, just like many CEOs are like, around the world, they want to be uh, having the comfort and security of being in an enclosed office workspace. And for a few industries, work from home works. But if we are all to be honest, we have to acknowledge the gaps in data security, the gaps mm -hmm. in the credibility of bids, whether you're bidding out your supply for toilet paper or insurance coverage, all those bids are now compromised because the bidding environment has become so loose. You know, you have files in the office that have been in lock and key in your office with very few people to access. And all of a sudden, lockdowns have said to companies, oh yeah, take those files home. You know, security has been totally thrown out the window and many companies are not admitting to the level of discrepancies and breaches in, in data mm. security, file security, financial security they went through in the last four years. And that's one of the reasons why CEOs are wanting to drive people back to the office. Mm. But the other thing we've lost is a sense of community because we're so unconnected by trying to connect digitally only. There's something with the beauty of being face to face with another person. You know, or a group of people, your team leaders. And the whole impromptu effort, when you have an idea, you express it on the fly, and you debate it on the fly. I think that's magic that we've lost in you know, online meetings. But how is it going to graduate? I think work, work near home. Partly because of this sense of community, and partly because infrastructure will compel companies to have hub and spoke models. Um, a small business like us with only 120 people, we're thinking of doing hub and spoke also. 
because there's a level of talent that we cannot access if we right. continue to insist yes. on locating in right. one geography. Right. And there's a market that we could access if we just allowed this to happen. Yeah? And companies are doing the same thing. And, and what is it about? It's about balance because you let the person commute one hour a day instead of three, six hours a day, you know? Uh, and hopefully that balance translates to productivity. Maybe not on a daily basis productivity, but over the long term, this person will actually be a much better employee, a much better worker. Certainly, given the global war for talent, and we, we feel it here in the Philippines as well, right? I think the new catchword uh, really <clears throat> is, is flexibility. Yeah. Uh, especially given that our industry is based on this bedrock of uh, human, human capital. So, on this same theme, David, you know, given the shifting dynamics, right, in work arrangements, what are some of the key trends or changes that you see in office spaces, uh, layouts, designs uh, that you anticipate that will be necessary for businesses yeah. to continue to thrive <clears throat> or adapt in, in the years ahead. And then you throw in Gen AI into that whole mix, and that's really quite a transformative you know, pot that we're talking about. Now, what are the implications of the property market? What, what changes from your vantage point, will AI have on workspaces in, in, in our country? So first of all, I think more and more developers, architects, designers, and tenants, most importantly the tenants, have to acknowledge the impact of global warming and carbon footprints. That, that is undeniable because of what we've seen recently in Florida, you know, insane weather that we've never had. And we're gonna see this year, next year, the year after, in the Visayas and eastern part of Philippines, as, uh, as more typhoons enter mm -hmm. the Philippines to a bigger scale, you know, unprecedented scale, we will be forced to have an appreciation of global warming and the impact of all that to communities and how companies will respond to that. Um, so that's why I think BPOs that are here will require more and more diverse footprint to mitigate and offset the risk of concentration. So concentration is not about Philippines. It's because you can, you can address that concentration risk by having multiple mm -hmm. sites all over the Philippines. Yeah? And there are so many geographies that we haven't That's penetrated right. where there is labor now, whereas 10 years ago there was no labor in those markets. Um, second is, yes, flexible design. There are ironically bigger square meters per person per seat yeah. to accommodate for a lot of common area spaces and, and collaboration spaces. And there's also the occasional beer pong events that you have every afternoon in the office and sleeping quarters in the office. Um, I like what SM is doing, converting their malls to disaster, um, disaster hubs. So if, if a calamity hits the the community, the evacuation center is the mall. Right. The mall is imperious. It is super solid material, made very, very well. It's got 100% backup power. It's got air conditioning. It's got restaurants in it. It's got food. It's got safe harbor for people to tide the storm. And I think more and more companies are going to do that. I remember Bong Borja when he ran what was then um, I think EGS, and they had a site in Tacloban when Yolanda hit and smashed uh, Tacloban. The call center was the place where people evacuated oh, right. too. And they made a conscious right. effort to say, if your family, if your member is employed by EGS Alorica, then your family is welcome to the floor. And that became a safe haven for them, you know? So David, uh, we have one more question. <clears throat> You have been known to possess a crystal ball. <laughs> so my, my question is, what, what does David Leachew's crystal ball say about the property market in the coming and years? And what would be your advice <coughs> uh, to the lucky people out there with some liquidity, right? And yeah. credit capacity. 
what would David Lee Chu buy today? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk. Maybe we'll answer that by saying two things. Pre-2030s, the decade of 2030, so the next six years, mm. and then the new decade 2030. Okay. Okay. So what, what am I buying? I'm buying city properties for my kids, okay? Because uh, I, I don't believe in locking all my children up in a business. I want them to be free to decide their fates on their own, as I did. I had the privilege of doing when I was growing up. So con you're talking condominiums? Condos in the city. Okay. Yeah, in the city. So Makati Bonifacio. Okay. Uh, and then I'm still a big fan of Alabang. So I think Alabang is still super cheap. There is a 60% discount between Alabang property versus Makati BGC property. And that discount is ridiculously l big. Okay. That gap should be much slower. We're talking much commercial, slower. residential? Uh, everything, everything. Everything. Everything and anything. You talk about uh, housing, you talk about office, you talk about the gap is ri ridiculously big. And it's going to keep closing, especially with work from home and companies deciding to locate in Alabang or in the other side, the north. But I, I really like the south because the south is a lot more structured. From mm -hmm. Alabang all the way to Batangas coastline, things are a lot more organized and structured in the south. And then I'm a big fan of Bohol and a big fan of El Nido. Okay? So I think capital in El Nido and Bohol. Only there. I'm not a fan of Shargao because, you know, Shargao is at the doormat of all the typhoons. And, you know, I'm just scared of all these typhoons and the damage. That's good. So Shargao is a great place to go during the summer. But as an asset owner, it's actually a very high risk proposition. Some, some great tips there. I'm going to call my broker right after the show, <laughs> David. And then uh, um, let's talk about life 2030s, the decade of 2030s. It will be one of the most transformational decades in human history because what will face us in 2030s and that decade? First, the adoption of AI, not just the development of AI, because everyone's developed, everyone and their uncle is developing some sort of AI for some sort of industry. But how much of that technology actually gets funded and adopted to the scale yeah. that we do now, very few of them will right. happen. Right. But the 2030s will be all about yeah. the adoption of AI. I am very um, disturbed by, for example, the Tesla Optimus, the robot, okay? the humanoid robot, or the A open AI figure 02, and 03 is around the corner. Humanoid robots that will take over the kitchen, mm. uh, fixing your bed, mopping your floor, working in farms, driving trucks, all those jobs are going to be compromised. You know? So when we start adopting that level of technology, as we only see in the movies now, to be everyday life, it will require a total different level of politics, a totally mm. different level of social structure to protect the ones that are weakened by it, by the tens of millions. Wow. You know? So that, how do we prepare for not just generative AI, but humanoid robots adapted to scale I mean, if you look at the concept of Bill Gates, when he was in his, what was he? Was he even? Uh, high school. High school. Yeah. And he said, Microsoft's vision, a, a, a computer for every household. So simple, right? But the vision of these robot makers will be a robot in every household. And what will that be like for us as humanity? <clears throat> the second thing is, we have to think about space and Mars because, um, yeah, um, SpaceX has a plan to launch the first people to land in Mars in the next 18 months from today, uh, not 118 months from now. It's 18 months from now. Wow. They will have their first people landing in Mars. 
but their first colony is targeted to be in the 2030s. Now just imagine, when the Wright brothers in 1903 first did that first flight, and the amount of industries that were created on back of the airline industry. Yeah. Right? How many industries would be created because of space travel? Right? And no, I am not doing drugs, guys. I don't do drugs. I don't do... But these are things that are coming our yeah. way within the decade of 2030s. And the third item would be longevity. Because longevity, okay, for 100 years ago, the life expectancy was 40. 300 years ago, the life expectancy was 25. Today, it is 75, 80. Easy. In the next 20, 30 years, it will be 100. It will be 120. It will be 150. It will be 200. Longevity is going to be dramatic because... And, the, and all these three things will be dependent on quantum mechanics and how yeah. that becomes the f and who builds the first quantum mechanic-based microchip. You really have a very uh, powerful and colorful crystal ball, uh, David, with all of that. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. But I want to thank you, David, for sharing all your insights uh, with us. You went beyond property, even got into quantum mechanics, my God. But thank you for uh, all of that and that wisdom. And that's it for today's show. I am Jack Madrid. Thank you so much to our valued guest, uh, David Lee Chu of LPC, for sharing his perspectives with us. Catch us again tomorrow for more enlightening discussions on Industry Beacon. You can catch BNC on free TV channel 31 and on signal channel 24 thank you for watching bnc the billionario news channel always on top